Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivas. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And today I'm going to talk about something that I'm using more and more in my practice as a little hack, as a little gimmick, but it's actually so darn effective. And I'm almost embarrassed to talk about it because I this is the antithesis of my form of practice. But one of the things we look at is the majority of my patients have insulin resistance, which results in obesity, diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome. They have ill health related to insulin resistance, which is high insulin levels and the inability to effectively use and store sugar as fat or as a uh, as glycogen and use it. So the dynamics are related to insulin resistance and the use of glycogen and glucose. And as such, um, a lot of our insulin resistant patients, um, what happens with them is two things. First of all, paradoxically, because of insulin resistance, there's this disconnect between glucagon and insulin that should be working opposite to each other. So you've got insulin trying to get the excessive amount of sugar that you're eating into your cells to be stored. And the paradox is that under the influence of insulin, you should have very little glucagon. Glucagon produces sugar primarily in the liver and releases fat. Well, the paradox of insulin resistance is you've got high levels of insulin and high levels of glucagon. It's called paradoxical gluconeogenesis. So you've got production of insulin, uh, sorry, production of sugar in the face of high blood sugar. And that's really problematic because it starts to damage blood vessels, starts to damage red blood cells. We become fat and diabetic. That's the paradigm. So how do we stop that? Well, the modern thinking is not stop people from eating carbohydrates because that would be asking someone to do something. And as a species, we've become pathetic. So we don't ask people to change their lifestyles. We've got a pill for that. We've got a pill for that. You don't need to do anything. Here's a pill. So one of the common pills that are used for diabetes management is metformin. And I love metformin. The reality is we have no idea what the hell metformin does. We think we know. We think metformin partially blocks the production of sugar by the liver, but we really have no idea. But every diabetic's on metformin, 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 every type 2. Here's metformin, every gestational diabetic. And it works, but it's like fighting against thunder. It really is an adjunct, but you've got to stop eating carbohydrates with it. And I love metformin. I prescribe it a fair amount. Got a lot of GI upset. A lot of people can't tolerate it, but a lot of people swear by it. Now, when you go to the ADA website, the American Diabetes Association website, there are 99 medications for the treatment of diabetes, and they do not advocate for a ketogenic diet. They say reducing carbohydrates might help you, but they've now also changed their mindset that remission from type 2 diabetes is possible. So we've played around with some of these medications, and they are horribly dangerous ones out there. The SGLT2 inhibitors, um, uh, like Giardians, are terrible medications when you start a ketogenic diet because they can cause diabetic ketoacidosis. So as soon as I see a new patient on that, we try to take that away. But what we've learned and what we've seen is there is one particular medication that I am a huge advocate for. And contrary to my normal beliefs, when I find something that works, when I find something biologically I can understand, I embrace it, I try it on myself usually, and we're using it more and more in our insulin resistant patients. That's kind of off-label because it's only supposed to be used for diabetes, but it is a wonderful drug, and we see weight loss, we see correction of insulin resistance, and we see a drop in blood sugar. And ultimately, what I'm looking for is normalization of blood sugar as the largest evil in terms of uh, disease creation is elevated, chronically elevated blood sugar. That's the, the quarterback of so many diseases. So what are we talking about? Well, if you look at insulin dynamics... When you eat food, um, there are several hormones that get released in response to certain types of food. And one of those hormones that gets respond, uh, uh, released in, in response to eating in the upper intestine, stomach and duodenum, is a hormone called GLP-1, glucose-like peptide, number one. And it goes, because it's a GI-released hormone, goes into the portal venous system, circulates around and comes back to the pancreas. And GLP-1 activates insulin release so that as you're starting to absorb that food, GLP-1 gets released early, triggers insulin, so the insulin's kind of waiting for this load of sugar coming in. 
okay? So GLP-1 is a very important hormone. GLP-1 is also one of the dominant satiety hormones. GLP-1 is highly activated by saturated fat and gives you a sense of satiety, a sense of fullness. So GLP-1 controls appetite, can, gives you early feedback so you eat less. You also stay kind of queasy, so you have this queasy, nauseated feeling when you overdo it. And GLP-1 prevents you from eating. Eh, I feel terrible. I don't feel like eating. So it's great in that it reduces how much you eat and also uh, reduces how often you eat, which results in weight loss, as well as triggering insulin release, which helps to clear the blood sugar, bring your blood sugar numbers down. And because you're not eating, it's easier to get into ketosis. Now, GLP-1 can be manuf is now manufactured as an injectable. And you've seen this on TV, folks, and it's advertised, the, the drug companies are advertising like crazy because it costs a ton of money and they're making ridiculous profits. Very cheap to make. GLP-1 uh, agonist, something that promotes GLP-1 release, very easy to make, very cheap to make. And yet they've marked this up through the roof and they're ad anytime you see on an ad on TV, for, uh, on TV for a medication, it's because they're making a shit ton of profit on it. And I hate that, but I love this drug. The drug we're talking about is a GLP-1 agonist. It creates, it triggers the release of GLP-1. And one of them that you'll see is a Zempic. There are others. There's Ribelius, there's Trulicity, there is Victoza. But this over here, this is Zempic is an injectable drug. And the cool thing is, it comes in a little pen, you dial in the dose, and you jab it into your thigh, your belly, and it lasts for a week. So you inject it and it works, it's a slow release molecule, it lasts for a week. We start at a low dose, and we slowly go up on the dose. I start my Ozempic at 0.5, Trulicity at 0.75, slightly different dosing regimen. I love this drug. I love this drug. I tried it myself first. It worked amazingly well, even at low doses. I wore a CGM. Even though my, I'm insulin sensitive, my blood sugars are good. I was able to drop my blood sugars by about 10 or 15 points. My patients will drop their blood sugars 20 or 30 points, which is perfect. My blood sugar is running in the high 60s, low 70s, about 10 or 15 points lower. And because I just, ugh, I felt queasy, I didn't feel so good, didn't eat very much, easy to do. Uh, a prolonged fast, very easy to do a prolonged fast, and um, it helped me to drop about 8 to 10 pounds. And I only used it for a short period of time. In fact, a funny story, and I'm a doctor, I know, not that smart, but I jabbed it into my leg and I pushed the button and released it. That's not how you're supposed to give it. You're supposed to jab it in and keep your finger on the, on the button for at least six seconds until you get the full dose. You know, of course, being male, and being a doctor, I know better, so I didn't read the instructions. You know, you cut once and then uh, measure after that and realize you measured wrong. No, carpentry, you cut twice and uh, you, you measure twice and cut once. I didn't read the instructions, dumb me, so please read the instructions. So I did that and I thought, oh God, I screwed this up. So I hit myself with a second dose. I double dosed for a week, because once it's in you, it's in for a week. I felt like crap. I had a perpetual sense of nausea. I didn't hardly ate for a week. Lost a ton of weight and you get better. But that's the beauty about this. Now, I was overdosed. Even if it gives me a slight nausea, slight, that slight effect, it's useful. But the second reason I like it for my carnivore patients is because here's the thing. When you eat a steak, when you eat fat and protein, goes into your stomach, gets absorbed as amino acids, your body doesn't immediately see sugar. So there's no insulin response. There's no insulin response. And even G if GLP-1 goes up, your blood sugar doesn't respond because you're not immediately right during and after a meal seeing the spike in sugar as you would with carbohydrates. That protein is being burnt to, turned over into sugar two, three, four hours later when you're not eating, if you're a carnivore, and therefore you're not getting that GLP bump, you're not getting that insulin bump. And now in my insulin suppressed patients, we're seeing that elevation of sugar that their bodies are unable to use and they're hyperglycemic. So the cool thing about Ozempic, the cool thing about Trulicity as a GP, GLP-1 agonist is there all the time. And when that blood sugar does go up, we do see a rise in insulin. We see a clearance of that sugar, especially if you've been physically active. So the cool part about this, it's a great, great drug. There's more to be told in the story. There's certain MEN type ones that, that 
are there certain rare conditions that you want to be aware of. But we are using this more and more and more in our insulin resistant patients or in our patients that are recovering to type 2 diabetes but still can't quite get their blood sugars below that 100, 110, 90 to 110, 120 range. This drops you by 20 or 30 points. I advocate its use with a CGM, but I never found even in me that my blood sugars went dangerously low. So I'm a, currently I may change my mind because I learn, but over the last probably six to eight months, we've been using this more and more, and I love the medication. However, it is expensive and it's difficult to get hold of, particularly if you don't meet their stringent diabetic criteria. But if you can get hold of it, and we will prescribe it for you, however you get hold of it is up to you. I love, love, love this medication, and it serves a positive purpose, not forever, but we use it for three to six months to really do that final recovery from insulin resistance into insulin sensitive. And then we withdraw the medication slowly. So you can go up on the dose and then slowly withdraw it. If you want to look into it, if you're interested, do your Google research and then come and ask us questions. Set up a visit. Text us at 561-517-0642. We'll get your blood work. We'll talk about the diet that's associated with it. We'll talk about everything and we will prescribe this medication if it is clinically appropriate and beneficial in my humble opinion. Don't just use it because you heard this video. I will decide based on my knowledge and my uh, evaluation of your blood work and where you are, whether I believe I am comfortable ethically prescribing it to you. But I love this medication. I wanted to share this with you because it is kept out there for the diabetics. And there's no difference between diabetes and insulin resistance. It's just a continuum. So I am the Carb Addiction Doc. If you're interested in this, give me a shout. 561-517-0642. Let's set up a visit. But give me your feedback. If you used it, if you hate it, if you love it, give me your feedback. And I think I talked earlier about metformin. I am preferring this medication to metformin or perhaps as an adjunct to metformin in a lot of my diabetic patients. So give me a shout. But if leave comments, hit the like button, hit the dislike button, leave comments. I personally have a philosophy that's opposed to medication, but sometimes there's benefit for a short period of time. Think, we'll talk again.